Let's pray. Yes, God, our Father, please assist us as we open your word. Help us to understand what we find here. Help us to act on what we understand. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen. Now, in these few weeks I'm with you, I'm jumping around the Gospels a little bit. Please forgive me for that. Uh, because I'm taking up a certain theme, deciding for Jesus. It seems that Jesus, uh, you know, could I express it like this, made a profession of putting people on the spot, putting people in a, a situation where they had to decide, what do you think about Jesus? What are you going to do about Jesus? He regularly did this. In his, uh, when people encountered him in the gospel. Now, this morning we're going to look at John's gospel and a well known part of that gospel, John chapter 18, chapters 18 and 19, which cover uh, the trial of Jesus uh, before Pilate. As I've probably said to you, um, John's gospel, uh, it's the simplest Greek in the New Testament. And all theological students who have to learn Greek wish that John had written the whole of the New Testament because Paul is a lot harder and Luke is quite difficult when it comes to the Greek and so forth. But, but John writes in the, in the simplest of language. So theological students love John. But it's the simplest language, but on the other hand, it's the profoundest and the deepest writing in the New Testament when it, when it comes to thought. And so John manages to combine these two things, simple language but profound thinking. Now, in their own way, ministers, you know, I and others, we, we try to do the same thing. So, um, you know, if I, if I make things complicated, you come, up, you come up and tell me. Because, you know, our job as ministers is, is not to complicate things or to speak in kind of fancy language that no one can understand. No, John is our model. Simplest Greek, well, why can't I use the simplest of English to get my message across? But on the other hand, we should also try to be deep and in our own way kind of profound so that we always give people something to think about. Even people who've been to church all their lives so that's, that's what us ministers need to be on about when we're teaching God's word. Keep it simple, but don't be simplistic. Established Christians don't want to come to church and just get revision, just to be told what they know already. So try to combine those things like John does in his gospel. Well, let's see how I go. You know, give me a mark out of 10, you know, kind of uh, don't hand, hold up any plank cards during the sermon, but, you know. Tell me otherwise. Tell me later if I've you know, kind of missed the mark entirely. But here is Jesus, all right, John chapter 18, uh, putting people on the spot, putting them in a position where they have to declare what they think, what, what, their, what their estimation is of Jesus Christ. Well, this time it's the turn of the Roman governor, Pilate, uh, it's the trial of Jesus. So as, as we begin to look here, we'll begin to wonder now who really is on trial? Who's sitting in the seat of the judge? Who is judging who here? But here is Pilate, the governor, and he asks Jesus uh, in verse 33, uh, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus asks him a question back, which is classic Jesus answering a question by asking a question. Notice he does that here. So Pilate has said, are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, what does Jesus answer? Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? So he questions Pilate, are you just parroting what other people are saying? Are these words that other people have put in your mouth? Is this what you think? Or are you just reflecting what others have been telling you? So is this your own discovery and estimation? Or is this just a story that you've heard from someone else? 
And it does seem, sadly, that all he is doing is repeating what other people are saying. Presumably, what the religious leaders have been saying about him. So notice in our Bible here, verse, uh, verses 28 and following, see, Pilate has been outside the palace with the religious leaders who've been making certain accusations about Jesus. Now he comes back into the palace, verse 33 in my version, Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Where did he get this idea from? Uh, notice what Pilate's answer is. He, <laughs> he asks a question. Jesus answers with a question. Now Pilate answers with a question. Uh, am I a Jew? Now, that makes obvious, isn't it? Yes, he's, he's, he's getting this idea, this title, King of the Jews. He's getting it from a Jewish source. Apparently, this is what the religious leaders who uh, want Jesus to be exercised, this is what they're accusing of, accusing him of. He claims to be king of the Jews. And so this is a second-hand recycled idea. It's not Pilate's idea at all. All he is doing here is reflecting what others are saying about Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? But notice Jesus doesn't let Pilate get away with this. This is not good enough. And so the question of Jesus, do you say this of your own accord or did others say this about you, about me? This question by Jesus is, is really a demand that the governor comes to his own conclusions about Jesus and declares what he thinks about Jesus. So here again is Jesus putting someone on the spot. Now, do you notice the similarity to what we uh, looked at when we looked at Mark chapter 8 a number of weeks ago? Uh, but you, who do you say that I am? Remember how he put his disciples on, on the spot. What are other people saying? But, but you, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And uh, last week in John chapter 6, at the end of John chapter 6, Others were making a decision about Jesus and actually turning away, no longer following him. But remember how Jesus said to his, the twelve, and what are you going to do? This is what others are doing. What are you going to do about me? Jesus putting people on the spot. And so here he is again, uh, this time toward the end of his ministry. This time it's Pilate. But who do you say? Uh, that I am. Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you uh, about me? And so here we have Pilate. Uh, he's the perfect illustration of the position that every man and woman and boy and girl is in. Needing to decide who is this person, Jesus Christ, and what am I going to do about it? So here's John. Remember the simplest Greek, the profoundest thinking? Do you see how the way John describes this situation and this trial, in the person of Pilate, he really is presenting to us the situation, the dilemma, the question that every person has to face and answer. What do we say about Jesus Christ. And poor old Pilate, it's a difficult decision. With Jesus inside the palace and the religious leaders outside the palace, here is poor old Pilate, the, the ham in the sandwich, which we can say about Gentile Pilate, can't we? Yep, the ham in the sandwich. He's going backwards and forwards. It's like the ball on the tennis court. In chapters 18 and 19, he is, you know, flip-flop Pilate, going inside and outside, having to make a decision, not wanting to make a decision. And so uh, this is kind of like the, the stage managing that, that, that John in his gospel is presenting here. And so there's a series of scenes, verses 28 to 32, outside the palace with the religious leaders. Now the rest of the chapter, uh, he's inside the palace and he'll go outside again. 
uh, how is he going to come to a decision? Here, here is Pilate being pulled one way and another by Jesus and the Jews, and neither are making it easy for Pilate. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent of any crime deserving death. He, he says so in, our past, in, in, in these chapters here. And yet on the other hand, he doesn't want a major disturbance in Jerusalem, not at this time. It's the Passover. But the population of the city has swirled several times over with all the pilgrims who've come to a feast. This is not a time when the governor wants rioting in the streets. And so an awful choice is being forced upon him. He has to decide between Jesus and the world. That's really what is being presented here. He's not going to be able to please everybody. And neither group is making it easy. The religious leaders are insisting that they want blood. They want Jesus executed. They need the authority of the governor if that's going to happen. On the, on the inside, Jesus is asking these awkward questions and talking about his kingship, though it's not a kingship of this world and so forth. <laughs> Both groups are making it terribly difficult for Pilate, who has to come down on one side or the other. What does he think? What decision is he going to make about Jesus? And this is the choice that faces Every person. Notice how Jesus says here, uh, he's come into the world, what does he say? To testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to me. And so Pilate, are you on the side of the truth? We will discover this. So here is Jesus on trial, but we definitely get the impression that it's Pilate who's in the hot seat. Pilate is on trial. And really we have this great trial scene here towards the end of John's Gospel, chapters 18 and 19, because in a real way, the whole of John's Gospel, the way it's presented, is a trial. The world is on trial. What, is the, what are the people of the world going to do about Jesus Christ? And there are different witnesses in favour of Jesus. The witness, in John chapter 5, it talks in those terms. Who are the people testifying to Jesus? Well, his own teaching and his miracles. Even Moses testifies of Jesus. See, there are various witnesses are called in favour of Jesus Christ. And so, so, so a great trial is taking place throughout the Gospel of John. This, this is one of the profound ways in which John presents the ministry of Jesus using his very simple Greek. And so it's hardly accidental here. At the end of the ministry of Jesus, and there's only his uh, crucifixion, resurrection to go, that... John gives some time and attention to this trial. And it's not really Jesus on trial at all, because the verdict about Jesus is obvious in the Gospel. All these things testify that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, his miracles, his teaching, the Old Testament scriptures, all, all the signs that Jesus performs which is the, the way in which the word that John uses in his gospel for the miracles of Jesus, they're signs pointing to who Jesus really is. Now, the, the world is on trial. Pilate is on trial. And indeed, we, the readers, are being placed in that position. What are we going to say about Jesus Christ. Remember John uh, in his gospel describes uh, in chapter 20 he gives a purpose statement. Why has he been writing these things? 
Uh, Chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the decision that we're called on to make. And John in his gospel is saying that everything proves Jesus' signs and his words. They prove that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and we are meant to put our faith in him. But here's Pilate. How is he going to decide? And sadly, he's this classic example of someone who ums and ahs, but then finally comes to the wrong decision about Jesus. The conflicting voices, the noisy voice of the world outside, the religious leaders clamoring for the blood of Jesus, and the calm and silent voice of truth on the inside, Jesus speaking to Pilate in the palace. This is exactly our position as readers of John. You and me, how are we going to decide? What decision will we make about Jesus Christ? Well, um, let me talk about some of the dangers The great danger, of course, is we're going to make no decision at all. But let me talk about some of the dangers that people face in making this decision. And uh, there's the danger in its way of the Christian home. How could the Christian home be dangerous? Growing up in a Christian home, you've heard the the truth about Jesus from your mother's knee. I can remember my mother before I could read. When she tucked me into bed, you know, she read a few Bible verses and prayed with me. The danger of the Christian home, growing up in a Christian atmosphere, certain Christian practices have become second nature just because of your upbringing, a Christian mother, a Christian father. The decision was made for you about going to church. You never had to decide whether you were going to go to church or not. You were taken to church. And your parents encouraged your Christian involvement. And you learnt to repeat certain things until you think that they're your own thoughts, but maybe they're not your own thoughts. They're just the thoughts that have been implanted in your mind by your loving and well-meaning parents. But growing up in a Christian home, you still have to come to that point of decision. You've still got to make your own conclusion about Jesus Christ. There's the danger of Christian companions, Christian friends, who are so pleasant and congenial and you like to be with them, with them and you slip into Christian ways of talking and acting because you're in their company. But that doesn't make someone a Christian. And it's not until you answer this question Uh, Is this your idea or only the idea of the people that you spend time with? The danger of Christian companions. Not realising that deciding about Jesus is a personal decision that everyone has to come to. And then there's the danger of a Christian school being brought up in that protected atmosphere with like-minded teachers who are only supportive of the Christian faith and they don't challenge Christian values and so you don't need to stand up or be counted. It's not like the, the swim or sink of state education perhaps. And it's only too possible for a young person to just drift along in that atmosphere and not realise that they're not a Christian at all. And there's the danger of youth group. Your friends, your peers, it's fun. And you quite like the Bible studies. But you'll outgrow that group and it's all too possible you'll outgrow the Christian faith because you never had that Christian faith yourself. 
And then there's the danger of a good church. A church where the Bible is taught and where you can accumulate Bible knowledge so that you're orthodox and you have sound views. But that's not the same as a personal faith in Christ. Now, do you see what I'm getting at as I'm talking about these dangers? What I'm saying is, and this is what Jesus is saying here, that borrowed convictions are not enough. There's the obligation upon each of us to do our own thinking. What do we think about Jesus? What are we going to do about Jesus Christ? And so there's the danger of the Christian hothouse, so to speak, and when we're, if we've grown up in that hothouse and if we're taken out of that hothouse for some reason, like we get too old to go to the youth group or we eventually get out of school, it seems like an eternity when we're in school, but I can assure you, young people, you'll eventually get out of school. When we're taken out of that hothouse, Will we be like a plant that will just wither and die because we don't have those special conditions around us any longer? What are we going to do about Jesus Christ? Now, you may have, you may have made this decision long ago. I, I trust so about Jesus. So why am I even talking about these things with you? Well, I never assume, in, uh, never assume in any church or any company company of God's people that everyone has come to that point of decision. But it's also it's helpful for all of us, isn't it, to think about the issues. Yes, that's right. It's only too possible, isn't it, for, for, for to to be in that Christian atmosphere, and maybe even because we're in that Christian atmosphere, just to assume that we're a Christian, we've never actually decided for ourselves what do we think about Jesus Christ and so just like Jesus here I suppose I'm trying to put you on the spot I'm asking you to stop and think and take stock and to consider for a moment is it possible that I'm in this very position that Pilate uh, is in here with borrowed conclusions about Jesus, but he's got to decide for himself. He's got to make a personal judgment and a decision about Jesus Christ. What does he think? What is he going to do? And so this Bible passage is challenging each one of us with the fact that we have to make a decision and only we God enabling in brackets can we make that decision only we our parents can't make that decision for us our teachers can't our friends can't not even our minister can what do we think about Jesus Christ in the words of Jesus do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the only Saviour of the world. Is this what you're saying? Or this is just what other people are saying? Uh, remember uh, the expression, God has children but no grandchildren. Um, <laughs> that's right. Uh, we each have to come to that point of decision. Now, I've been speaking about dangers... Well, of course, these dangers are also, if we look at them another way, wonderful advantages, aren't they? Something to capitalise, something to build on and make use of. Uh, the privilege, the advantage of growing up in a Christian home with parents who have a living faith in Jesus Christ so that you're daily in touch with the real thing. It's a danger if you're not going to make use of it. <laughs> if it lulls you into thinking, I must be a Christian because my parents believe. But also a wonderful advantage. Living with people who live for Jesus Christ. 
or the advantage of going to a good church where weekly you are in contact with people through whom the light of Jesus is flowing because you can see this and how they speak and what they do. The Christian faith can't be a theory if you've got weekly contact with people like this, with a living faith. So these different things can be disadvantages. They can be dangerous, but they can also be wonderful advantages and privileges. And some of you maybe have had those privileges ever since you were born or you've entered into that privilege as you've started to come to church and be part of the life of the church. But for other people, the Christian faith might just be a theory, something they've heard about. But if you've grown up in a Christian home or you've had Christian teachers or you're part of the life of the church, this is not just theory. You've seen the real thing in action before your eyes. Well, what uh, use are you going to make of this golden opportunity that God in his good providence has given you? Well, I'm urging, but even more importantly, Jesus is urging every one of us, do you say this of your own accord or did others say this to you about me? And, And it's finally a question of truth. Remember how Jesus said in in our, our passage here that he came into the world to testify to the truth. Notice he's using that court language. The world is on trial. And Jesus in that court is testifying to the truth. See, Christianity's greatest recommendation is that it's true say a lot of other things about the Christian faith, but this is something really, it, it is actually true. It's, the, it's true in the absolute sense because it gives us the truth about God and about humanity and how we can come into relationship with God, how our sin problem can be sorted out and solved. It's the truth about the most important things of all. And it's also the truth in the practical sense that it's true to life. If people come to faith and seek to live out their faith, that's actually how people are meant to live in the world. The life functions better, the world functions better if people love one another, for example, as Jesus taught us to do. In the absolute sense, the practical sense, it is the truth To be a Christian is to live truly and to truly live. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. To believe anything else is to believe a lie and to live any other way is to live a lie. So finally, the most important reason for facing this decision, making this decision, making it in the right way, having Jesus as our Saviour and Lord is that it's the truth. And Jesus here challenges each one of us, you and I, have you made that decision? Let's pray. Yes, God our Father, we thank you that Jesus came into the world to proclaim the truth. But Lord, so many people preferred darkness to light and preferred a lie to the truth. Lord, don't let any one of us make that wrong decision. Please don't let any one of us avoid making any decision. Lord, rather may the purpose of the coming of Jesus, the purpose of the Gospel of John, that we might have faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Lord, bring each one of us to that point of enlisting in his service, asking him to be our saviour, making him our Lord. And we pray this in his name. Amen.